Good Can morning, you? Council. Good morning. May it please the Court, Anna Kulari, on behalf of the Commonwealth. Uh, I'd like to start briefly with joint venture and then move on to the Sixth Amendment issue. Here, given the Commonwealth's case and the judge's joint venture instruction, the jury had to have convicted the defendant of being the perpetrator of the armed robbery. Um, despite this, it was still proper for the uh, judge to instruct the jury that he could be convicted on joint venture as well. As this court recently held in Commonwealth v. Marrero, um, the fact that the defendant was the perpetrator does not um, negate the fact that he was also a joint venturer, and here he was a joint venturer with uh, one of the women, Ms. Splain. And um, when the judge instructed, I, I understand that she, she said that the Commonwealth's theory was that he was the uh, perpetrator. Was it just Ms. Splain and not, didn't mention um, Penn, Ms. Penn. Ms. Penn. No, it was only in regards to Ms. Blaine. Um, the evidence that Penn was actually involved with this is minimal, um, and there's a question of whether she I actually just couldn't was figure involved. Out. I, that, that's fine. No, it was only for Ms. Blaine, the woman who was actually in the car with the victim prior to right. the defendant getting right. in. Unless there are any other questions on joint venture, I'll move to the Sixth Amendment issue. Uh, here, the judge uh, properly exercised her discretion and allowed the um, Penn's statement uh, to come in as a non-testimonial, spontaneous utterance. Uh, what, do, do you think, uh, what impact, if any, do you think the recent Supreme Court case has on this case, Michigan versus Bryant? It, it does have some impact um, in a few ways. The first way is that um, it's very clear that if this is an emergency situation and that's the primary purpose, um, then it does come in as a non-testimonial um, statement as long as it meets one of the other hearsay exceptions here as a spontaneous utterance. Um, the other way that it changes kind of the jurisprudence of this state is with Gonzalez. Um, the inquiry when you're going into testimonial in fact is from the perspective of the declarant. And I think Michigan v. Bryant says it's very clear that it's not only the declarant but also the responders or the recipients of that statement. So it does change the um, legal analysis that way. Uh, however, in this case, it doesn't under either Gonzalez or Michigan v. Bryant, you still come out with the same um, determination that this was a non-testimonial spontaneous utterance. Now, the statement was, uh, he's got a gun in a black sock? He has a gun and he's wrapping it in a black sock. Yes, she, the police, there's four officers, they enter the apartment building, they knock on the door, they say, police, is there anyone home? They don't hear any response, they knock multiple times, they're actually on their way down the stairs, assuming no one's home, and she opens the door and comes out. Um, she's shaking, she's nervous, her hands are up, and she says, uh, he has a gun, he's wrapping it in a black sock. They immediately take her, move her to the stairs, so she's away, the door's still open. They announce police again, they say, is anyone in there? There's no response, they subsequently move her, um, they remove her from the building, actually, um, and put her in a police cruiser. So that was the sum total of the statement. There was no questioning by the police officers, um, either before the statement was made or even after. They assumed that it was an emergency. They didn't ask any further detail. Her statement was rather limited in the information. It was purely, there's someone with a gun in that apartment. He's wrapping it in a black sock. Um, she didn't do any other, she didn't say anything else to identify the person. Obviously, it's the person in that apartment, but there's nothing more um, to the statement other than to state the emergency situation for the police to fully understand it and to remove herself from that situation. D d was the, the question of the non-testimonial analysis ever raised below? Not in, not exactly. There was a motion in limine and the defense counsel focused mainly on the fact that um, it was unreliable. Um, the judge did specifically find that it um, did not violate Crawford um, but there wasn't an extensive discussion on it, and obviously since this trial, the, the law has changed. Um, but there was some discussion. The judge was aware of it. She did find it was a spontaneous utterance, and she specifically found that it did not violate Crawford. The defendant's um, argument was mainly that this was unreliable because she apparently um, allegedly recanted a year later to his, in private, his private investigator. Do, do, does that change the, uh, the standard of review with respect to this portion of the question? Uh, with respect to whether or not it's a... Substantial likelihood versus prejudicial error? No, or versus, it doesn't. Versus harmless beyond a reasonable doubt? Uh, no, because this is a Sixth Amendment issue, um, it would be harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. But there was no, um, there was no objection to this. Um, when, and the uh, 
the idea that it is not reliable actually doesn't play a part into whether or not it's admissible as a non-testimonial spontaneous utterance. Um, what that does is go to the weight, and that's proper to go to the jury as to whether or not or how much credit they give the statement. Uh, but it doesn't affect the judge's determination as to whether or not it should be admitted at trial. If there was no objection, even though I agree with you, the standard is harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, but that's with an objection, isn't it? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I must have misunderstood the question. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, but here the judge was proper in allowing it in, um, regardless of whether or not there was an objection what the standard is. I think the judge properly um, determined um, within her discretion that this met both the hearsay exception and was non-testimonial. Uh, if, if, I, if I could turn your attention to the denial of the impeachment of Penn. Yes. Uh, is it your view that if there had been, if the defense attorney had called the investigator and made an offer of proof seeking to get in what, the, what Ms. Penn told the investigator, that it would have been error for the judge to exclude that? Yes, under Mahar, it, was, it would have been error to exclude that. Had the defendant made the appropriate showing as to um, the appropriate proffer, then yes, it would have been error. Now, but, but why is, I went back to, the, uh, to look at the motion, well, I guess the motion to eliminate was, was being done while the jury was being brought up, uh, and there is on the record an offer of proof, uh, albeit earlier. Why is that offer of proof and the judge's apparent denial of the motion in limine sufficient to, uh, to, uh, to, to say that that's properly preserved? Well, the way it occurred was uh, actually the motion in limine to include the statement um, and where the first uh, mention of, the, uh, of Penn's recantation of this occurred in the morning uh, when the motion in limine was brought up and it was used as the way to exclude it as being a non- as being not an excited utterance. It didn't meet the uh, requisite level to be included. So that was the first instance that it was brought up. Um, the judge decided that it would be admitted, and then after the break, the defendant brought it up again in the afternoon when, um, the, uh, when the jury was being brought up. However, the offer of proof was actually earlier than that, um, in the morning when the jury was not being brought up during the motion to eliminate stage, and it was fully I think he explained it. I mean, there's three or four paragraphs where he explained what his issue was with it. And the judge didn't exclude it. She expressed some skepticism, and she said, I think you're going to have a difficult time. Um, but she allowed the, the uh, private investigator to be put on the witness list. She told defense counsel, please make an offer of proof at trial. Um, she didn't explicitly rule one way or the other. She did express some skepticism, but I think with motions and limites, a lot of times the trial judges do reserve judgment until trial to see what the evidence comes out um, and how defense counsel attempts to admit the evidence. Um, so it was proper for her to reserve judgment on that. Um, and no, I don't believe it was a proper, even if it was a proffer, um, and it gives this court a record as to what the defendant wanted to get in, there was no objection when she said, um, please make a proffer at, uh, an offer of proof at trial. He said, okay. Um, and that was the end of the discussion. There wasn't an objection. He didn't try and call the, the investigator. He didn't um, attempt to get this in in any other way. It, it appears from the record that he changed his mind for whatever tactical reason. Well, I mean, I gather he would have had to call the investigator for the sole purpose of putting in this evidence, which mm -hmm. the judge had said, uh, I think you'll have difficulty with the admissibility of that, and then said, then, then you can make an offer of proof to make sure the record is preserved for the purposes of any appellate review. Why would that not be understood to be a ruling on the motion to eliminate? Uh, because she didn't deny it. She said, at trial, please make an offer of proof here so we have a record. And the defendant had another chance to bring it in. He could have pointed the judge to Mahar. He could have brought the uh, investigator in. Um, he failed to do so. This isn't an, this isn't, uh, an instance where the, the motion in limine, for example, was denied or whatever the ruling before the judge was denied and the defendant said, I object, and she said, your rights are preserved. Any objection made at a motion in limine needs to be, be uh, renewed at trial unless the judge says your rights are protected, um, yes, and affirms that anything at trial would be useless. 
Now, um, I, I read the, the closing argument of the prosecutor, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the prosecutor never argued um, anything at all about the excited utterance in closing. I believe there was one mention of it. <clears throat> Um, and I believe it was in the sequence of. But the, uh, but the focus of the closing argument was the eyewitness, was the victim's yes, identification. Yes. Um, and, and that's an important point to make. I think her statement um, does do something to connect the uh, gun to the defendant. But having said that, the uh, victim identified the defendant. He described the gun. The gun was later found um, outside of the broken window of the defendant's apartment, um, very close, and it matched the description of the gun. So while it does tend to tighten the um, link between the gun and the defendant, it's not the only evidence that ties the uh, weapon to the defendant. If I could go back, I'm sorry, to, to Michigan versus Bryan. Yes. That was an interrogation case, and this is not. Correct. So why should we say that Michigan versus Bryan governs here when, as opposed to the second prong of Gonsalves, that is whether a reasonable person would believe the information to be used in the investigation or prosecution of a crime? Well, I believe in Michigan v. Bryant, they say that the analysis applies whether or not there's interrogation. Interrogation is simply one way to um, look at the analysis, and that's how you can determine, um, because under Michigan v. Bryant, you look at both the declarant and the recipient's um, point of view, their words, actions, and what their um, intended goals are. However, simply because there's no questioning um, does not remove it from the analysis. Uh, well, how do you apply the primary purpose of the interrogation when there's no interrogation? It, it is a little bit more difficult. However, I think you can look at the actions of the officers here. The officers came up to the apartment. They knocked on the door. They said, police, is anyone home? When she came out, she made her statement. Their immediate um, reaction wasn't to engage in interrogation, but to move her away for safety. They didn't ask her any questions. They moved her down the um, out of the way of the door, down the stairways. Um, and I think that their lack of interrogation shows that they interpreted her statement to be, this is an emergency, I need help, rather than um, engaging in further investigation as to what was going on. And so I think that's how you can look at it here. So you're saying, so you're saying the focus should be on the state of mind of the police officers? No, it's both of them. It's, it's the police officers, the, the recipient who heard the statement, as well as um, Penn who made the statement. I mean, obviously that's an important part of this, and that's how uh, Michigan v. Bryan shifts this away from Gonzalez, because in Gonzalez it's purely the, um, whether or not the declarant intended this to be used in the investigation or prosecution but isn't of crime. It, but isn't Michigan v. Bryant a, a reasonable person standard? Yes, but it does so, vary. I mean, so how, how do we focus on the state of mind of the individuals based on a reasonable person standard? So from the way I interpret it is it is you take what is known to both the, the what is known, the words and actions of both the declarant and the recipient, and you apply a reasonable person standard to that information. Um, it gets a little more complicated. <laughs> Unless there are any further questions, I'll rest on my brief. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, there is a, I, I'm sorry, I do have a question. Um, the doctrine of verbal completeness. Yes. Um, it, it, it wasn't, um, I mean, there was nothing really inculpatory, I don't think, that was in the statement, but, but it, seems, it seems to be a little unfair uh, to run through the defendant's entire statement and leave out the very end where he says, I didn't rob that guy. Um, the whole point of getting in the investigation or the conversation between the police officer and the defendant is to see what he had to say. And if the guy didn't have anything inculpatory to say, why put the non-inculpatory stuff in? Well, I think the first, this is a self-serving statement, that last part, that I ain't robbed nobody. Um, and so that's not properly allowed in unless it explains something that... It, it explains did. everything that happened before. It explains the fact that the police officers were interrogating him to find out whether he had any involvement in the robbery. That's true, but the rest of the statement uh, that the defendant made, his basic premise was, I was asleep in my apartment, these two women set me up, and extrapolating from that, that he obviously had nothing to do with the armed robbery. Had this gone in, would it have changed the Commonwealth's case? No, I don't think it would have made one bit of difference, and that's because the rest of the evidence that came in was his theory was, or his defense was, I had nothing to do with this. These women set me up. I wasn't there. I don't know what's going on. I didn't rob anyone. 
Um, I think it was properly excluded because it was a self-serving statement. Did it make a difference? No, because the rest of his theory and the evidence that was put in was I wasn't involved in this. Yes. But this is true, but this is more specific in that I didn't do the crime. The rest of it was um, where he was, what he was doing. I was in my apartment. I was sleeping. Um, but it's in the context of being asked about this robbery. I mean, it's not just he didn't go up to the police and say, you know, what I was doing last night, I was sleeping in my apartment. Uh, true, and, and, I, and I, the, um, the statements came in as, uh, yes, you're right. It was in that context. Um, but I believe that with the other statements that did come in, the point of that he didn't do the robbery was made clear and that it was unnecessary to come in. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Catherine Eves, and I'm here today on behalf of Mr. Daryl Smith. Um, I would like to start with the Confrontation Clause argument as well. Um, it's, I believe, um, a, the most important issue in this case. What um, I mean, it, it, he's got a gun. Mm -hmm. Why isn't that the statement, the primary purpose of which is to convey the fact of an emergency. He's got a gun. Well, I think, I think Michigan v. Bryant is helpful in this context, and I think Michigan v. Bryant is actually very harmonious with Gonzalez. And what Michigan v. Bryant says is that to determine whether a statement like this is testimonial, to determine whether a reasonable person in Mahogany Penn's position would anticipate that her statement would be used to investigate a crime, you have to look at all of the facts and circumstances that surround that statement. And the critical point here, and what makes Michigan v. Bryant's decision that an emergency in and of itself doesn't answer the inquiry so important, is that it, 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 the truth of it is shown in this case. Because the fact that Trent Harvey reported an armed robbery, the fact that there were police officers downstairs, the fact that they were looking for suspects, doesn't answer the inquiry from Mahogany Penn's statement and whether she knew in that circumstance because of who she was. And who she was was a suspect. But she wasn't present during the robbery. She was present. The facts and circumstances that the parties knew, the police knew at the time, was that Trent Harvey told them at the scene. She, she came, let's go back to the, wait, wait, they're at the she, scene. She was not in the car when the robbery took place. Well, that was the later story. The story, but, and Michigan v. Bryant says it's what the people knew at the time, not with the benefit of hindsight. Mr. Harvey's story changed significantly. But at the scene that morning, he was telling the police officers that he was walking down the street and three people, two women and a man, surrounded him. The man had a gun and they robbed him. Elizabeth Splane comes out from behind 37 Wales Street and he says, there's one of the two women who robbed me. They grab her and they put her in the back of a police cruiser. Mahogany Penn comes out of 37 Wales Street, talks to Elizabeth Splane, goes back into 37 Wales Street, and as she's walking away, Trent Harvey says, there's the other woman who robbed me. Is there any evidence that she heard that? No, there's no evidence that she heard that. And, and the defendant had an investigator that talked to Ms. Penn, isn't that right? That's correct. And, and, and reported some of the conversation that Ms. Penn had with the investigator to the court, and it never contained any information about what, uh, what she said she knew about either the robbery or what Splane had told her when she went down to the car. Well, again, what the Supreme Court has said is that this is an objective person standard. You measure it by what the facts and circumstances are at the time. Uh, can well, I just get back? You're describing as a fact and circumstance something that the victim in this case earlier stated to be true, but by the time of trial had said, no, I actually, because I can't be driving a car and all these other reasons, I, that didn't happen. I was actually in the car. She wasn't in the car at that time. How can you assume the subjective understanding of, of the parties is based on something that didn't take place during the trial? Well, I'm, I'm missing something, I think. Yes, what I'm trying to say is that whether Trent Harvey later left her out of the picture what the police knew at the scene was that she was one of the armed robbers. That's what he told her. When she made that statement, she was identified as one of the... But what the police knew, I mean, 
that may, that may have an impact if you've got an interrogation. It would seem to me it'd be more relevant. What the police knew at the scene ha is more relevant when there's an interrogation. Well, I we don't have that here. Well, I think it's reasonable to assume, I mean, even in the, the ultimate fact, that's, that's part of the problem with this and whether it's harmless beyond a reasonable doubt is that Trent Harvey's story changed at least four times. So what I'm saying is that, frankly, I don't know how, mahogany, how involved Mahogany Penn was in this. By the time we got to trial, the Commonwealth didn't charge her, but she was there, even in his latest version, she was there outside the car. Um, and as Judge Donovan said with the joint venture instruction, there was evidence that these two women were somewhat involved. Where the, what the actual facts were truly, we can't tell. But what Michigan v. Bryant tells us is that you measure the statement in light of what's going on. Was, this, was this argued in front of the trial judge? What was argued to the trial judge is that you can't call, you can't have her statement come in. If you have her statement come in where she says, he's got a gun in there, then the confrontation clause is completely gone. But, but, but the Michigan v. v. Bryant and the Gonsalves issue was never presented to the trial judge. Isn't that right? Well, I think he argued that it would be a violation of the confrontation clause to admit her statement without her being present to be cross-examined. And so I believe that under this court's precedent, that's preserved for full review by this court. Um, and I believe the standard is whether the admission was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. I think there's no question that what- Factually, factually, it was never presented to the trial judge that either uh, Penn knew or should have known uh, that uh, she was being implicated in a crime. Well, I, I think the argument is, under all the circumstances, not whether she was being implicated in a crime. The question is, is that in the facts and circumstances of that case, even if she did not overhear Trent Harvey say, there's the other woman who robbed me. She knows full well that the police are there. She knows something, even on Mr. Harvey's testimony at trial, she's there when Mr. Smith jumps in the car. She knows that they are investigating some sort of crime. She knows, a reasonable person in that position knows or should know that their statement is going to be used to investigate a crime against the accused. He's got a gun. He's got a gun in the apartment. It doesn't have to Splain, be. Splain had a prior record. Uh, she, as far as Penn knew, at least looking down on this, as far as Penn knew, uh, Splain was being arrested for something completely, completely different. Well, I think that even with the benefit of Mr. Harvey's testimony at trial, that Ms. Penn was there when Ms. Splain got out of the car and Mr. Smith got in the car and they drove away. They're, the next thing she knows, she's back. They're back at 37 Whale Street. There are police. They are questioning Mr. Harvey. He's there at the scene. Ms. Splain is in the back of a cruiser. She talks to Elizabeth Splain in the back of the cruiser and then goes back upstairs. It doesn't have to be as nefarious as she knows she's a suspect. Well, although but, but it, but it, it has, has to. Does ahead, she? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She go. has to. The, whether a reasonable person in her position would know that saying to the police, "He's got a gun." and he's putting it in a black sock, would be used to investigate a crime against him. And the answer to that, I, I don't see how it could be anything other than, yes, a reasonable person in that position knows that. Now the question of whether in that situation, depending on what the real facts are, and as argued in my reply brief, you know, if her involvement were more significant, the statement should never have come in under any analysis of, of reliability because if she was one of the armed robbers, a statement that she makes to the police after the armed robbery is, is completely suspect. She's, she's saying he's got the gun. And it's significant in, as far as a harmlessness analysis. It was a key to this, the Commonwealth's case, because execution of a search warrant turned up nothing in the apartment. The, the events happened very quickly. The robbery, you know, according to Trent Harvey, the robbery happened. He called 911, the police get there, Mr. Smith is found in the apartment. Execution of the search warrant, no money. And they looked hard. No gold chain, that was a very distinct, distinctive gold chain. No matching black sock, no ammunition, nothing ties 
Mr. Smith to that robbery. Well, wasn't the sock found outside of the apartment? Right, but the there's no matching, no matching sock. And that's why that statement was so important to the Commonwealth. Yeah, but that sounds like a great closing argument, but it doesn't go to the issue of the admissibility of an excited utterance. Well, the question of whether it's an excited utterance in the facts and circumstances of that, I mean, even if it is an excited utterance, you still have to analyze whether it should not have been admitted um, without giving Mr. Smith the opportunity to cross-examine her. I think there is sufficient amb ambiguity in this case about what her intent was, that very much like Sylvia Crawford in Crawford versus Washington, the only way to test out what Mahogany Penn's perception of her situation was to cross-examine her. That is all that, that confrontation asked for. Not that the statement could never come in, but she needed to be there. The jury needed to see her. And he had the right to have her cross-examined, to have the jury see her demeanor. Because there is such ambiguity about what her role was in this case. Doesn't that, doesn't that get you back to her subjective belief and intent? And isn't that what Michigan v. Bryant says you don't do? Well, I've, well, well, Michigan v. Bryant deals with how you analyze whether a testimonial statement that has been admitted without the benefit of cross, whether a statement admitted without the benefit of cross examination was in fact testimonial and is an objective standard. But if she had appeared to testify, of course you cross examine a witness for all their subjective biases. I understand that, but I guess maybe I'm, maybe I'm just confused. But it seems to me you're saying the reason you can't can't decide this sort of trying to figure out what would an objective person do in these circumstances. You really need to have what her subjective belief was. Well, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that. No, I'm actually not. I, what I'm saying is that cross-examination was really the only way to get at that, and that's why it's a confrontation clause violation to admit that statement without the benefit of cross-examination, because you can't get behind what she knew you know, what she saw, whether that statement was reliable. Coming in as non-testimonial and the argument of the defendant is subjective, you know, I, I want to be able to cross-examine this person because let me tell you, uh, that person had a incredibly strong motive either to lie or <clears throat> to, to stick it to, you know, my client, et cetera, et cetera. Well, right, I understand what you're saying. I think the answer to that is that, that then you are back, if you're in the position, you have to argue from an objective person. Would a person in Mahogany Penn's position have an understanding or you know, could a reasonable person in that position anticipate that her statement would be used to investigate a crime? And certainly, you know, the line between what's actually an emergency and, and eliminates the um, the possibility of fabrication and where the line is crossed into, you know, there's an emergency situation, but she's got other motivations or she may have other motivations is not an easy one. I just think that in this, the facts of this case, you know, very much like Sylvia Crawford's statement, you know, it, she was a suspect. It was different in the sense that she was being interrogated at the time. But what Justice Scalia says is exactly what I think is apl applicable here. Whether she was really trying to help out in an emergency or whether she was pointing the finger at her cohort, that ambiguity needed to be teased out before the jury in this case. But, but, but it's, it seems as though your, your premise is, is based on speculation and it's not based on any objective facts. I think it's based on, a on all objective facts, Your Honor. I would respectfully disagree with that. The objective facts are the police are on the scene, Trent Harvey is talking to them. She comes downstairs. She sees the police. She sees Elizabeth Splane in the back of a cruiser. She talks to her. She goes back upstairs. The police come to the door within five to ten minutes and knock and announce their presence. There's no answer. They, they start to walk away. And only then she opens the door and says, runs out and is very nervous and says, he's got a gun and he's wrapping it in a black sock. A person in that position knows, a reasonable person in that position knows that the police are going to use that statement to investigate a crime against the person in there, whoever that person is in there. 
So I think those are the objective facts. And, and then you look at those objective facts and you say, what would a reasonable person in, in those shoes have understood? By that reasoning, if a woman calls 911 and says, my husband is beating me, uh, you would say that is that would not fall within uh, that that would require her testimony, that they, even though it's a utterance, because she was calling the police and a reasonable person under those circumstances would know that the police would use that statement against her. Right, and that obviously that's not so. The, the line... It, Where is the line then? Why is, well, that, right, why, that, why, is, why is that not the case in my example, but the case here? That's exactly what the Supreme Court talks about in Michigan v. Bryant and why the test is a little bit mushy, but the idea is, is that a person who calls 911 and says, my husband is beating me now, you know, that falls on the line of this is a statement made to secure police assistance in an emergency. This, there's nobody who's saying, um, you know, the caller is actually a perpetrator of some crime. Um, it, it plainly falls, you know, it's Davis v. Washington. It falls on the, on the right side of non-testimonial. As you start to move along, you know, each set of facts and circumstances present their own but I mean, scenarios. But in my example, the husband would probably say she initiated it, and she was simply the first one to call 911 so she could get her side of the story in. So, I mean, it's not as if there's not ambiguity in those circumstances, too. I suppose there could be ambiguity in those circumstances, but on the facts that I think in the ordinary case, you have the call, it comes in. I think there's a lot more ambiguity where you know, you look at what everybody knew at the scene, and what everybody knew at the scene was that she was supposed to be one of the armed robbers. Council, we'll have to leave it there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.